grab your copy of God's Word and turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. Um, I am excited to continue to go through uh, the book of Philippians. I think it is a wonderful book. And if you weren't here last week, last week we saw that Paul uh, is sitting in jail as, as, he is, as he is writing this. And he's waiting to hear his sentence. He's trying to figure out if he's going to be either set free or possibly even put to death. But even in those circumstances, his focus was not on himself. Uh, first, his focus was on Jesus. Uh, secondly, his focus was on others and, and ways to encourage them and serve them. And lastly, uh, even when he focused on himself, he still focused on others, uh, which is wonderful to see. So we saw that for us to have joy... Uh, we must first have our priorities straight. Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. And this order should not change even when we're in hard circumstances. Even when we are in the midst of trials, our priorities uh, should still stay the same. Today, with the text we're going to be looking at, we're going to continue right where we picked up, uh, pick up right where we left off. Uh, last week, and it's it's kind of in the middle of a, of a of a section too, so we need to remember that. Uh, what I want us to to walk out of here today with, if you remember one thing, uh, and it's kind of the the title of the sermon as well. The title is "Love Leads to Worship," uh, but if you remember one thing, I want you to remember that our worship to God will grow through our love. Our worship to God will grow through our love. So for, uh, Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 8. Uh, verse 8. The Word of God says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, as we look at what your word has to say, God, my prayer is that your word shapes our lives. God, soften our hearts for your word to shape our hearts. God, we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So the first point that I see when I look at this text is that our love is Christ's love. And I do want to give a little caveat because more accurately I would say that our love should reflect Christ's love. This is something that, that each and every committed follower of Christ should strive for. For our love to look like the love of Jesus Christ. This should be one of the most basic tenets of our faith, is to love like Christ loved. Now Paul starts off what we are looking at today by continuing what he was saying last week. So for us to get the full context of this, I want us to look at part of, of what we looked last week. So starting in verse 3, Paul says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And now we get to the text that we're looking at today where he starts off and says, For God is my witness. So with this statement right here, Paul is assuring them that what? Of, of everything that he has just said, he is assuring them of that. So we see in that his heart for the people in the church from what he has just said, starting in verse 3. But right here in verse 8, Paul gives them a, a guarantee. Uh, he's basically 
swearing to them that what he is about to say is true. He is giving them what you might call an oath. Paul is a committed follower of Jesus Christ. There's no argument about that. So everything that he does is a reflection of this identity, of him being a committed follower of Christ. So when Paul says something, uh, I think we can be assured that it is the truth. Specifically when we look at Scripture, because we know that Scripture is God's Word, so we know that it is true. So when Paul is speaking here, we know that it is truth. So with Paul giving the, them an oath, he is speaking to the church at Philippi, so he is giving them an oath. He is uh, assuring them that he truly feels this way. Paul loved these people dearly. And not just some of them, but, but as it says in verse 7 that we looked at last week, all of them. He cares about all of them. Paul is very sincere in his words when he speaks to them. And he is going to, to continue this in this verse. He tells them, I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now this word yearn, I want to point out that this word is a very strong word. This word means that you greatly desire or you long for something. Recently I have put myself on a low carb diet, almost a carb free diet. So I would say that I yearn to eat pasta and bread right now. I long for it. And this may seem like a very simple idea, but we have things that we love for and we long for and we care for in this world. And when we're not able to have them, we yearn for them. We miss them. If I were to go for an extended period of time without seeing my wife, I would yearn to be with her. If I were not able to be here with you, Emmanuel Baptist Church, I would yearn to be with you. This is a very strong word. And it shows the, the intensity of the love that Paul has for the church at Philippi. And it says that he yearns with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, I don't want you to be grossed out by this, but the word affection when it is translated, literally means intestines. So he, he yearns with the intestines of Christ Jesus is what he's saying. Now this isn't some weird belief that Paul has about the intestines of Jesus, but this is a metaphor that Paul is using. He is saying that he is yearning for the people so deeply that he feels it to his very core, of his very inside that he wants to be with them. He yearns for them. Pastor Steve Austin says this. He says, This fervent affection for others must mark our lives. We must do more than simply endure other believers. We must lovingly care for other believers. And this is what Paul is doing when he is saying this. He is caring for them very deeply. Let us be reminded that Paul is sitting in jail as he is writing this. But while he is sitting in jail, he yearned to be with the church of Philippi. We should feel that same way about our local church. If we're not able to be here, we should yearn to be with the body. So I want, to think of, I want us to think about this for a second. The idea of, of yearning to be with our church. So how are we to do that? How are we to yearn to be with our church? How are we to love the church of Jesus Christ so much? First of all, our hearts must be right. If you do not love God the way that he wants us to love him, and that is with all of our hearts, not just some of our hearts, then you will, you will not be able to love one another if you're not able to love God with all your heart. Next, we are to sacrificially love each other. Now this may be, this may manifest itself in different ways with each of us, but we are called to give ourselves up for one another if needed be. Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love 
as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So to walk in love means that we are able to sacrifice ourselves for one another. This is how we will see our love is Christ when we are able to do that. Next, I see that our love should grow. Our love should grow. In verse 9 it says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. So Paul right here, he, you may not even notice it, but he's beginning a prayer for the church at Philippi. He tells them first that his prayer is that their love will abound. The idea of, of abounding is to grow, but not only to grow, but to, to exceed all limitations. So if you were a runner, for you to abound would mean that you were to break the record for running. If you were a, a weightlifter, for you to abound would mean that you would break the record for lifting weights. Paul tells them that they are to exceed all limitations with their love. And what should our love grow and abound in? Well, first of all, our love should, our love for God should always be growing. And the question you may have is, well, how do I grow in my love for God? And I think that's a very honest question if you have that today. Well, if you're married, just to put it into a, a little illustration here, if you're married, I would hope that you understand what it means to grow in your love for someone else. You have to get to know your spouse. You have to put time and effort into your marriage. You, you have to understand who they are and how they love. I think we can all agree that just being married does not mean that you are in a growing relationship with your spouse. Just because you're married does not mean that you are growing in the relationship that you have with your spouse. You can get off from work and you can go to the bar and stay at the bar till midnight getting drunk and then come home and never spend time with your spouse. But you're still married. At least on paper. But what you're not is you're not in a, in a healthy and growing relationship with your spouse. Now the same is true with our relationship with God. We have to be actively spending time with God through the reading of God's word and through prayer. We must actively be seeking the will of God in our lives and doing the things that he commands us to do in scripture. We must be gathering together with other believers and serving and loving one another and those around us. This is why we should jump at, at opportunities like we have right now of, of serving uh, places in our, in our city like Central Elementary. This is how we have a growing relationship with God. Now that's first of all. Next, and I truly believe this is where Paul is going with this, is we must be abounding in our love for one another. Ba abounding in our love for one another. This, this is done by spending time with each other. And I would argue that, that this growth is even deeper when it happens outside of the walls of this building. Whenever you have people over at your house or you're hanging out with them, that is when your love for one another grows even deeper. I love spending time with people. I love things like talking about theology and, and sharpening one another biblically. But also, if you know me very well, I like to just shoot the breeze sometimes. You can ask my wife about that whenever she's waiting for me to get home 30 minutes after I said I would be home because I started talking to someone. You abound in love by one another by spending time with each other. You abound in love for one another by getting to know one another and learning about one another. You hear the stories of their lives and you get to understand who people are. You hear about their testimony of what God has done for them. You abound in love for one another by serving with one another as well. And this isn't just a commandment from Paul, but 
But Jesus Christ gives us a similar command. Matthew 22, he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is what Paul's saying right here too. Love those around you. We see in both areas that we are called to love. To both love God and love each other. But I think we need to remember that one leads to the other. For you to truly be able to love each other, you must first love God. Then Paul says that the way we can abound in love more and more is with knowledge and all so don't you think that if you can abound in love for God and abound in love for one another, that you will be able to grow in knowledge and discernment? And not only will we be able to grow in knowledge and discernment, but it is because of our knowledge and discernment that we are able to grow in our love. One plays off of the other. By knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and seeing what He has done for us, through the greatest act of love that has ever been displayed, of dying on the cross and shedding his blood for us, this will grow us in our love for one another. Our love should be continuously growing, and it will grow because of our love for Christ. Next, I see that our love is our love is pure. And more appropriately, I think, I think this is another time where we should see this as our, grow, our goal. That by our growing relationship with Jesus Christ, that we should strive for our love to be pure. So more correctly, our, our love should be pure, is what the point truly is. And Paul tells us in verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. We are to love one another with the love of Christ so that we may approve what is excellent. This word approve, it can be, it can be a little tricky because it, it isn't necessarily the way that we would use this word. The word approve comes from the Greek word. You didn't know you was going to get a, a Greek lesson here today. It comes from the Greek word dokimazo. Now there's going to be a test afterwards. I'm just kidding. This word is used to describe the process of, of testing certain metals and coins to see if they meet certain standards. So what Paul is telling them is that by loving each other, they will be able to discern and to test and to point out what is excellent about the way that they love each other. We're able to test our love for one another. See if it is excellent. And we must still do that today. There is nothing different today about this need to love one another from the time that Paul wrote this. We must still love each other so that we may be able to test and to discern what is excellent and loving one another. This approval process or or discernment comes by one thing, and that is trials. That was the theme last week in the first part of this letter, having joy in the midst of trials. This should be how we grow in our love for one another. We are shaped by the trials that we face and how we react to them. This is why our hope must be in Jesus Christ. If not, when we make it out of a trial, then we may want to give credit to ourselves for getting out of it. The same when we are loving one another. If we do not have our focus on Jesus Christ and are completely devoted to Jesus Christ, then when we do a good job of loving one another, we give ourselves the credit. You see how good I love that? It's easy to do. By way of, of discernment and examination of how we love, we will either see that we are, one, 
growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ while we are loving others, or two, we will see that we are doing things for selfish gain. He continues and says, and, be, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So after we test what is excellent, we will see if our love is pure and blameless. We are to have an examination of our own selves right here. And I want to point out that yes, this is a personal examination of our own lives, but we can use this when we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ as well. We can use it to encourage them and to uplift them. If we see someone that isn't doing a very good job of, of loving their brothers and sisters, we should be able to go to them. And with this verse right here that we're reading, and show them that they should be doing a better job. How, do we ever, how did we ever get to the point in, in church, in the global church, when we could not go to each other with concerns with how someone is living? Why do we feel like we cannot take Scripture and use it the way that it is intended to help someone grow in their relationship with Christ? And we see that in 2 Timothy 3. 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It is our duties as brothers and sisters in Christ to use Scripture to build up the body of Christ. If we are not able to do this, the body will become unhealthy, it will suffer, and ultimately it will become disunified. Let us love the Word of God to the point that we can see our church family failing, falling, and are there to pick them up with the Word of God. And I want to say that if you have a problem with someone taking Scripture and correcting you with Scripture, then your problem is not with that person. It is with God. And it is with God's word. You have a problem with the authority that God has over your life. Now going back to being pure and blameless here in this passage, this is us examining our lives. The words pure and blameless are the words that they would use to describe clay pot. When they, would, when they would take them out into the sun and examine them for cracks. They would hold them up against the sun and look for cracks in the clay pots to see if they were usable, to see if they could hold water. But if, it, if, they, did have, if they did not have cracks in them, they were described as pure or sincere and blameless. That is what Paul is praying for over the lives of the church of Philip. For them to be pure and blameless in their own lives. That no person could look at them and find flaws and lovelessness within them. And this is why we should pray for each other today. We should pray that each other is pure and blameless. That people can look at each one of us in this room and know that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Because they can examine our lives and see that we are pure and blameless. Not only for the world to see it, but to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. As he said. For our judgment day that is to come, when we will be examined, our love is to be pure. Next in verse 11, I see that our love leads to our worship. Our love leads to our worship. He says in verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness. So let's think about fruit for a second. I'm sure that there's many people in the room that, that have had at least some experience with growing some sort of fruit or possibly even vegetable. Uh, you know that, that it starts with a seed. Everything that grows, every plant starts with a seed. You, you then take that seed and you plant it. And then the seed grows into either a tree or a bush. And then the seed 
produces fruit. This fruit of righteousness began in, in their lives as a seed sprouting at the point of their conversion, of their salvation. And as we grow as, as committed followers of, of Jesus Christ, we begin to produce that fruit ourselves. And we know that we are growing by the fruit that we produce. This fruit comes from us conforming our lives to being like Jesus Christ. It begins at our salvation, like I said, and this starts the sprouting. And one of the ways that fruit can be seen in our lives is how we love others. This is what it's all about. It's all about us loving God to the point that our lives changed. And because of that, we cannot help but to love others. It's like we can't even, we can't stop it from happening. Because we love God so much, we can't stop it from happening, of us loving others. And where does this fruit of righteousness come from? It comes from us and the work that we do, right? No. Paul tells us right here that it comes through Jesus. It comes through Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying is that we cannot make ourselves righteous by the things that we do or think or, or ultimately by loving others. We cannot make ourselves righteous by what we do. Non-believers can show others love. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus Christ to love them. But what makes our love different as committed followers of Christ is that we are filled by the fruit of righteousness that only comes from Jesus Christ. This is what we call the, the doctrine of imputed righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Because of Jesus taking our sins, we are made righteous in the eyes of God. When you repent and you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the righteousness of Jesus placed upon your life. You are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the evidence of this profession can be seen by someone growing in their relationship with Christ and being a committed follower of Jesus Christ. So why does this all, all this happen? Why, why does all these things happen? Why did Jesus shed his blood to cover our sins so that we can first love God? And because of that, we are able to love others to the point that we can examine ourselves and be made blameless and pure in the sight of not only the world, but of God. That, that's what Paul, if you want to summarize it, that's what Paul has just said. So why did all this happen? It's very simple. To the glory and praise of God. To the glory and praise of God. This, this is the reason for our existence. You may have you may not have ever heard this, but there are things called catechisms. A catechism is a question and an answer, and it is used for us to memorize something. A catechism, I love catechisms. I, I love, I want to put a caveat with that, I love scripturally accurate catechisms. I believe that we all, even as adults, the majority of us are adults in this room, should be memorizing and learning scripturally accurate catechisms because it is, it is a way, it is a wonderful way to learn scripture and to learn about God and to learn about man. There's one called the Westminster Shorter Catechism and the first question of that is what is the chief end of man? So basically what it is asking is why were we created as human beings? And that's the question here and, and Paul answers it. The answer to the catechism is this. It is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Everyone always wants to know what God's plan for their life is. It's right here. 
to the glory and praise of God. That is why you were created. God's plan is for, for your life and for you to first come to Him as your Lord and Savior. And then, as you are able to grow in your worship to Him until you stand before Him on the day of judgment. And then you will worship Him for eternity if you are a believer in Christ. Our goal as believers should ultimately be to grow in our worship towards God. Like I said, if you want to remember one thing from this sermon is we grow as we love others in our worship of God. To give God praise and glory and honor, not just on Sunday morning, Yes, I am so glad that you come week in and week out right here to Emmanuel Baptist Church. But that is not the goal of our Christian lives, to gather on Sunday mornings together. I want us to have lives of worship day in and day out. As we go into this world, as we go to the grocery store, as we talk to our neighbors, as we go to work and talk to our coworkers, let us have lives of worship so that the world can see not just Sunday believers but committed followers of Jesus Christ who live their lives in worship I've met many people and I'm sure you have too that, that want to slide through this life by doing as little as possible to worship And you don't see spiritual growth in the lives of these people. They make a profession, they come to church, and that's it. We don't see growth. We don't see them outdoing the commands of God. Those are the ones who are, even right here today, are still sitting at home, using COVID as an excuse not to come to church. Now, I'm not saying everybody that sits at home is using this as an excuse. So don't, don't take it as I'm insensitive to the real thing. But there are people who are sitting at home using COVID as an excuse not to go to church. And you can go to Walmart tonight and you'll meet them shopping at Walmart without that. They're not committed followers of Jesus Christ. Our worship is both the problem and the solution. If we are worshiping other things besides Jesus Christ the way to fix that that is a problem the solution to fix that is to worship Jesus Christ to become worshipers of Christ God demands our worship as we claim to be committed followers of Christ if you claim to be a committed follower of Christ God demands our worship our love love is what strengthens our worship. The greater that we love God, the greater that we love others, and then the greater we love God, we are able to worship God. Not only individually, but that could be said as a body of Christ right here. As we come together and we grow in our love for God, and we grow in our love for one another, the greater our worship will be together. As we join in on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights as we come here to worship God. Our love for God is what strengthens our worship. So I ask that we let our worship continue to grow in strength as we grow in our love for God through our worship and through the reading of God's Word and through our prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the fact that your word still speaks to us today. It is not just words on a page, but it is change that happens in hearts. God, if, if there are people in here that, that do not know you, that are feeling drawn towards you, God, I pray that they repent and believe in you, that you draw them in you adopt them into the family of God. God, 
God, let us be changed.